So guys, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel and please hit the like button on this video. So guys, in this next news story, a musician who stabbed a university student to death following a flippant remark about his skateboarding skills was today told by the victim's mother that the victim is the man you will never be. Shiloh Pottinger was confronted by Luke O'Connor's mother after she delivered a statement at his sentencing hearing. She told him that Luke had made more of a difference to this world than you ever will. Pottinger is believed to have bought a 13-inch Mafia stiletto flick knife online before using it to stab Luke eight times last October and he was today given a 15-year sentence following another example of Britain's knife crime epidemic. It just comes days after two Nottingham students were stabbed to death as they walked home from a night out in the city. I just want to say rest in peace, Luke, and my condolences go out to your family. Luke's father also said how many more parents, families and friends have to go through the pain and the heartache that knife crime brings. Luke's mother said the sentence imposed on Pottinger does not reflect the magnitude of the crime or the loss of Luke's life. She said, as we have seen from Luke's death and the others only this week, knife crime is becoming more and more of a common occurrence. As a society, we need to find a way to control the access of knives and to push for changes in the law, especially in sentencing around knife crime. So early this year, Pottinger, who was also 19, was convicted of the manslaughter of Mr O'Connor, who was a second year business management student at the Manchester Met University after being cleared of murder. He claimed he'd been acting in self-defence. Today, the judge said Pottinger lashed out because he felt humiliated by the students laughing at him as he attempted to intimidate them. So the row broke out as Lucas from Bedfordshire walked home from a house party with two friends in the heart of Manchester students' area. One of the friends walked past Pottinger who was holding a skateboard and asked him if he could do a kick flick. Pottinger, himself a music student, hit Luke on the head with the skateboard before it flew out of his hand when he tried a second strike. As Luke tried to push him away, Pottinger repeatedly stabbed him to the body, causing catastrophic blood loss. Addressing his sentencing at the same court today, Luke's mother spelt out the impact of the violent, senseless loss of a beautiful kind son. During the trial, Pottinger's barrister claimed that Mr O'Connor, who was six foot two, was towering over the defendants and up for a fight. But his mother said that Luke and his two brothers had always been taught that it takes a stronger man to walk away. He said Luke was not looking for a fight. I know he wasn't. It's not in his DNA. He would never condone any violence. Luke's mother said Luke had tried to walk away only for Pottinger to follow him. She said Luke stood up to his killer and paid the ultimate price, his life. She said Pottinger had been blowing kisses to his family during the trial and she said what I would do to see my son and blow kisses. Addressing Pottinger, she said this person has shown no remorse, has not taken any responsibility for his actions. I refuse for your name to pass my lips because you don't deserve it. You took his last breath. You tore our hearts out and shattered our lives. By contrast, she said Luke had the ability to light up any room that he went into. She said he was kind. He saw the positive in anything or anyone and he was calm. She said Luke made me proud every single day of his life and that one thing that can never be taken away from me. So in his sentencing remarks, Judge Nicholas Dean KC said many parents feel a sense of trepidation when their children go off to university. No parent though expects their child to be senselessly attacked and killed, their child's life to be taken away in events from start to finish, which lasted just a handful of seconds. Judge Dean said he agreed with Mr O'Connor's mother that Pottinger had shown no remorse for his actions that night. He said, you have felt sorry for the one person and one person only and that is yourself. The judge said he was satisfied that Pottinger met the test of being classed as a dangerous offender, but said he didn't consider a life sentence or extended sentence necessary. As I stated, he sentenced Pottinger to 15 years in jail, of which he will serve two-thirds in custody. And Judge Dean said he would have sentenced Pottinger to 18 years, but reduced it by three years for his youth, immaturity and previous good character. You, Shiloh Pottinger, are now 20 years old. You were 19 in October last year. Luke O'Connor was only 19 years old when he met his death at your hands. During your trial, uh, much was said about you and your character. 
That's a subject that I will return to. But as Luke's mother has pointed out today in her victim personal evidence, little was said about Luke. In October last year, Luke was in his second year at Met Manchester Metropolitan University. He was happy and he was thriving. Any parent whose child departs for university at 18, as Luke had, will feel a sense of trepidation about what their child might encounter, particularly perhaps in a large city. No parent, though, expects their child to be senselessly attacked and killed, their child's life to be taken away in events which from start to finish lasted just a handful of seconds. We have heard the moving victim personal statements of Luke's parents. They describe Luke as a kind and caring individual. Luke's mother said this, he had the ability to light up any room he went into with his beaming aura and cheeky grin. He was a gentle giant and had a heart of gold and the kindest of souls. He had fantastic morals and values, helping others who were less able. As is to be expected, the effect of Luke's death no doubt in part because it was so violent and because his family have had to relive it in this court, has been profound. Luke's family are broken, they are distraught, and they will never fully heal. As Luke's mother said, our family is broken, we will learn to live again because Luke would want us to, but we will never be able to be complete again. One of Luke's qualities was that he stood up to bullies. That Luke stood up to you was, as I'll come to, what led you to attack Luke in the way that you did. I, of course, heard the evidence in your trial. During the trial, you told many lies. I've read and considered the written submissions put before the court concerning what happened between you and Luke, and I've considered what has been said on your behalf today. Much of it I reject. The starting point in this regard is to consider why you acquired the stiletto flick knife you used to stab Luke. You claimed you had bought it as a tool to use to apply grip tape to skateboards. This was an out and out lie. A stiletto flick knife is not a tool for applying grip tape to skateboards. It is a weapon, a deadly weapon. That a flick knife can be used to apply grip tape is no doubt true. But as your internet search history demonstrated, you showed no interest in acquiring a tool. You searched only for knives designed to be weapons. You bought the flick knife because you found it desirable. And in my judgment, you bought it because it gave you a sense of empowerment to carry it. You claimed in your evidence that when you went out during the evening of the 25th of October, you picked up the flick knife by mistake, thinking you picked up your vape device. Whether you had been using the flick knife that afternoon and early evening to apply grip tape uh, is doubtful, but it's also unimportant. In my judgment, you took the flick knife with you when you left your home, quite deliberately, and you did so because of the sense of empowerment the, the knife gave you. You next lied about why you chose to avoid the security in place at bar 256. You jumped the wall because you knew that the security at that bar 
would find the flick knife and they would confiscate it. Jumping the wall had nothing to do with you not having ID. Why, when you left bar 256, you chose to walk along the Wilmslow Road is hard to know. There is no reason to think that you were looking for trouble or worse, looking for an opportunity to use the flick knife. If it is true that you were going to a fast food outlet, a matter of a few metres from where you were to encounter Luke O'Connor, then it's puzzling that you made no effort in fact to go to the establishment in question. But why you were where you were is immaterial. You then lied about the encounter with Luke O'Connor and his friends, Charlie Robertson and Daisy Wood. They did not shout out or say or do anything to draw your attention to them as they turned into Wilmslow Road, nor did they in any way target you or walk towards you in any way that was threatening or even concerning. What happened was that as he passed you, Charlie Robertson made some jocular remark to you, a remark you reacted to and which led you to confront at Luke O'Connor. Perhaps the remark, which referred to the skateboard that you were carrying, was irritating to hear. But it wasn't more than irritating, and it certainly wasn't intimidating. Still less was it threatening. It is clear to me that uh, you reacted to Charlie Robertson's remark in a way that was aggressive and needlessly aggressive. That you reacted in the way that you did is a mark of your immaturity and in my judgment it reflects arrogance arising in part from the fact that you knew you were carrying a weapon. During your trial you chose to portray Luke O'Connor as the aggressor in your encounter with him. He was not. That Luke O'Connor challenged your pathetic reaction to Charlie Robertson's remark does not make him the aggressor. Almost as soon as you were challenged, you produced the flick knife, and whatever you may have been saying to Luke O'Connor, you used the flick knife to threaten. You raised it and held it towards Luke at close range. Although you, in your evidence, sought to portray yourself as being on the defensive, that was not so. You were not in fear of Luke. You were not surrounded, as you claimed to have thought you were in your evidence. In truth, you were offended by the fact that Luke O'Connor was not cowed by your threats or your violence. Your own evidence in the trial gave away the truth when you said that Luke, at the point you attacked him with the skateboard, was laughing at you. Indeed, Luke was laughing at you. But you then said, I thought he wasn't taking me seriously. Later in your evidence, describing the same point in time, you said, he was trying to make me. He was trying to get a reaction out of me. He laughed at me. I found it humiliating. He was still laughing at me and mocking me. In effect, in your own evidence, you were blaming Luke, to use your own word, for making you attack him with the flick knife. It was at that point that you advanced towards uh, Luke with the flick knife in your right hand. Your right hand was extended and the knife was ready to use. In what followed, Luke O'Connor did what he was able to do to defend himself. He pushed and punched as best he could. But you used the flick knife repeatedly to stab him. It has been asserted on your behalf that you were using minimal force, 
and that because you were using your right, which is your non-dominant hand, to wield the knife, you were choosing to use less force uh, than you might have used with your left hand. The truth is that you use the force you could use and as Dr. Lum said in his evidence, you can be seen to stab quickly and the speed of the knife indicated moderate to severe force. I accept that you would have had little time to think, but I reject the suggestion that you made in your evidence that you suffered some sort of concussion before you stabbed Luke and may not have been thinking very clearly because you were reacting to Luke trying to push you away. But nevertheless, you were stabbing with the flick knife entirely deliberately. The jury rejected your evidence that you acted in self-defense. There was, in my judgment, no evidence of self no element of self-defense in your actions. The jury found that you lacked the intention that would otherwise make you guilty of murder. I have no difficulty in concluding that your intention from the point at which you advanced on Luke O'Connor with the knife extended in your right hand and then throughout the remainder of what transpired was to cause Luke harm, falling just short of grievous bodily harm, just short of really serious harm. There is just one more aspect of what happened on the 26th of October that I will mention. In your evidence, you spoke about approaching two young women and asking them to call an ambulance. This occurred a short distance from your attack on Luke and, of course, after you had run off. We know from the unchallenged evidence of the young women that you did not say who the ambulance was for but you had suffered a quite serious cut to your hand. In your evidence to the jury, you said that you had asked for the ambulance because you wanted to get help for Luke. Of course, you had to accept that you had told the young women to cancel the ambulance. The evidence that you gave that you intended the ambulance to be for Luke was a blatant lie. You said it to try to manipulate the jury to think that you were genuinely concerned for Luke and to, and to try to persuade the court that you felt and feel some degree of remorse. As Luke's mother has said, one person is to blame for Luke not being with her today. One person that chose to walk out of his house with a lethal weapon one person that chose to use that lethal weapon to stab eight times. This person has shown no remorse and has not taken any responsibility for his actions. That person is you, Shiloh Pottinger. I agree with Luke's mother that you have taken no responsibility for your behavior. I agree that you have shown no remorse. You have felt sorry for one person and one person only, and that is yourself. During the trial, I heard evidence of aspects of your character that are to your credit. And indeed, before these events, you've been in no trouble of any sort. For that, I give you credit. As will have been obvious from what I've said, what you did arises in part from your immaturity. You carried the knife because of the sense of empowerment it gave you. A more mature 19-year-old would have realized the stupidity of that. You attacked Luke because he, you felt, humiliated you by laughing at you and by not backing away from your aggression. A, a more mature 19-year-old would not have done that. Your youth your good character and your immaturity are all factors which serve to reduce the sentence that would otherwise be appropriate. In turning to address the sentence appropriate in your case, I must begin by considering whether you are a dangerous offender. It might seem that someone prepared to carry a flick knife 
who then uses that knife to inflict fatal injuries must, as a matter of common sense, be a dangerous offender. However, dangerousness has a statutory definition, and I must consider whether you, Shiloh Pottinger, represent a significant risk to members of the public uh, of uh, causing uh, serious harm by the commission by you of further specified offences. In essence, in your case, I must decide whether there is a significant risk that you might again do something similar to what you did on the 26th of October 2022. What is of concern in your case is that the evidence demonstrates that you showed interest in acquiring combat-type knives. As I've said, I reject as a lie the idea that you bought the flick knife as a tool. You chose to take the flick knife with you when you went out on the 25th of October and you produced the knife and then used it in a threatening way to walk towards Luke O'Connor when there was, and I emphasize this, absolutely no reason for you to do so. You went on to use the knife to attack Luke O'Connor and you intended to cause him harm. What you did can only have been intended to cause harm falling just short of really serious harm. The account that you gave of the events of the 25th and 26th of October to the author of the pre-sentence report contains further lies and your account remains at odds with what the CCTV material demonstrates. You appear to have told the probation service that the flick knife was a fashionable looking knife. The idea that a flick knife of this type might be considered to be fashionable looking is a further sign of your immaturity. The pre-sentence report considers the issue of dangerousness and presents the various factors which feed into the assessment of dangerousness. What is suggested is that there was a coalescing, coalescing of circumstances unlikely to be repeated, although that, of course, is very largely because you are in custody and have been since your arrest. Aspects of the factual analysis by the author of the pre-sentence report seem to me to be deficient. For example, the suggestion that, as is said in the report, the evidence gathered by police and communicated by the Crown indicates that allegations of assault by the victim and his male friend on Mr. Pottinger are credible. They were not and they are not. It is also said, whilst Mr. Pottinger provides a plausible reason for carrying this knife erroneously, that reason that you mistook the knife for your vape device was not plausible and on the contrary was a lie. That said, in drawing together the various strands of what must be considered when assessing dangerousness, the author of the pre-sentence report concludes that you represent a high risk of serious harm to a section of the public. The pre-sentence report is somewhat equivocal in assessing whether you are a dangerous offender within the meaning of the relevant legislation. But as I've said, some of what said, is said in the pre-sentence report is factually inaccurate. Considering all the evidence that I heard in the trial, as well as what I've learned about you since, it seems to me that you do represent a significant risk of causing serious harm to members of the public by committing further specified offences. That said, Whilst I find that you are a dangerous offender, I do not conclude that either a life sentence or an extended sentence is required. In view of the jury's conclusions about intent, but more so because of your age and your good character, this is very clearly not a case in which a discretionary life sentence is required or justified. I have considered whether an extended sentence is called for. The only practical effect of an extended sentence in your case would be some extension 
of the license period applicable after your release. And I have to consider whether such is necessary to protect the public uh, from the risk of serious harm that you pose. When you are released from the sentence that I intend to impose, you will be a significantly older, and it is to be hoped, more mature man. Both before your release, but importantly also when you are on license, you will have to engage in intensive work, work designed to address the reasons that you acted as you did, and to ensure that you do not act in that way ever again. In all the circumstances, an extension of what will anyway be a lengthy license period is not called for. I will say at this stage that I've reminded myself of the character evidence given on your behalf during the trial, and I've read and considered the statement of Sophie B. I've considered too all that has been said on your behalf by Miss Gray, King's Counsel, the character evidence, as well as speaking of your positive qualities, actually suggests that you are mature for your years. I do not believe that you are. Your interest in knives, your actions on the 25th and 26th of October, your behaviour in the hours and the days after you killed Luke O'Connor, and your lies during the trial, all, degree, all indicate a degree of immaturity. Your good character and your immaturity are both factors which serve to reduce the sentence I must impose. You have not, however, shown remorse. On the contrary, you sought to blame Luke O'Connor for what you did. You are not to be punished for that, but remorse is not a mitigating feature in this case. The Sentencing Council guidelines for unlawful act manslaughter have been discussed in detail. I conclude that your case falls into the category of very high culpability, that is culpability or fault at level A. The reasons for that are these. You acquired a deadly weapon and you did so because you were attracted by the idea of possessing this type of knife. You chose to take the weapon with you and to carry it in public places. You produced the knife and used it to threaten, having absolutely no cause or excuse for doing so. You were then aggressive and violent using your skateboard as a weapon and then for a second time producing the knife and attacking Luke O'Connor with it. You stabbed multiple times with a weapon and in such a way which although this was not your intention, was always likely, in fact, to result in death. Further, you had every opportunity to disengage with Luke O'Connor. This combination of factors, but particularly the fact that you carried an unlawful and deadly weapon with you and then repeatedly stabbed with it, amounts to an extreme representation of factors which would otherwise fall into Category B of the Sensing Council guidelines. Category A of the, sense of the guidelines involves a range of sentence of between 11 and 24 years, a wide range to reflect the very varied circumstances in which unlawful act manslaughter can occur. My conclusion that this case falls into Category A takes into account the several factors here that feed into the assessment of culpability so that there are no additional aggravating features to consider. Before mitigating features are considered, it seems to me that the appropriate sentence would be 18 years detention. The mitigating features in your case are your youth, your immaturity, and your good character. There is, of course, considerable overlap between these factors. In my judgment, the sentence should be reduced by three years to reflect the mitigation available to you. It follows that the sentence for manslaughter, which was the jury's verdict on count one, will be 15 years detention. 
Count two is in effect fully accounted for in the sentence for manslaughter, and for that there will be a concurrent sentence of six months detention. The total sentence is therefore 15 years detention under section 262 of the Sentencing Act 2020. You will serve two thirds of the sentence before being released. When you are released, you will be on license. If you offend whilst you're on license, you'll be returned to prison and you'll be dealt with for any further offending. The time that you have spent in custody since your arrest will count in full towards the sentence I have imposed. I will order the deprivation and destruction of the flick knife and the statutory surcharge will apply. So guys, there's a new story coming from the streets of the UK. Once again, I just want to say rest in peace, Luke, and my condolences go out to your family. It's your boy GC. Keep it locked, keep it real.